Okay, let's, let's turn to God's word. Shall we pray? Father, thank you so much for the gift of your word. Thank you that you, in your mercy, your wisdom, your grace, you have shown us your mind on how you want us to live, your mind on how the ages of this earth are to continue and to culminate. Lord, there's so much in your word, and we thank you that it's true. It's inspired by you, by your Holy Spirit, and it speaks of your Son, Jesus. And Lord, we pray that as we look into your word now, you would speak to us by your Spirit. Please anoint my lips, my words, but Lord, we all need to receive, and we ask that you would do a mighty work this morning in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. <coughs> well, um, for the benefit of any visitors, we're working through the book of Romans, and uh, we've got to chapter 3 this morning. Um, if you have a Bible, you might want to follow through, but all the scriptures are on the screen, so uh, it's not crucial if you don't have one. There are some in the basket at the back if you want, want one. Um, and Romans is a really carefully crafted argument that, that Paul has constructed. Paul wrote the letter, and we've, we've had a few weeks of bad news, and um, in our journey so far, we've seen how Paul has shown that all people are without excuse regarding their response to God. Firstly, God has created an amazing universe in which we can see his handiwork as, as our creator. And just to sort of summarize Paul's argument so far, the first point, which he was aiming really at the Gentiles, uh, he was showing that they, they have fallen short of God's righteous standard, uh, and therefore they're under his judgment and his wrath. And uh, partly that's because of God being so clearly seen in creation, so everyone is without excuse. If you sort of step back and think about the beauty of what God's made, there has got to be a creator. The second point was that the Jewish people to whom the Old Testament was given, they're no better off than the Gentiles because they too are guilty and they are also under the judgment and wrath of God. The Jews have received more revelation than the Gentiles because they had uh, the Old Testament given to them. They have had many more experiences of God uh, and yet despite their privileged position, they didn't give God the glory as they should, the glory that God deserved, but they rebelled against him by and large. And so they are now just as guilty as the Gentiles. And the good news today is that we are coming to the bad news, coming to the end of the bad news in this letter. We've had a few weeks where Paul's been showing how everyone's guilty and he's going to uh, conclude that part of the letter today. Next time, we've got some good news coming. So, so hang on in there, uh, hold your breath, and the good news is coming. Um, <coughs> so, and, but Paul has wanted to show clearly how all mankind is fallen, each, all mankind is sinful, and uh, having set that out, Paul is then able to bring through the beauty of our salvation that we have in Jesus Christ. Uh, and last time, we, as we ended in chapter 2, Paul explained that there is no inherent value in circumcision for the Jews unless it is accompanied by faith and obedience to the law. So we start today in chapter 3, and Paul's argument progresses to. Um, that's going to work. It's on. It was working just now, but I don't know what's happening to it. Oh, there we are. <coughs> um, uh, the argument progresses to ask, is there any advantage in being a Jew? So, just to pick up the passage, what advantage then has the Jew? Or what is the profit of circumcision? Much in every way. Chiefly because to them were committed the oracles of God. For what if some did not believe? Will their unbelief make the faithfulness of God without effect? Certainly not. Indeed, let God be true, but every man a liar, as it is written, that you may be justified in your words and may overcome when you are judged. 
So at the end of chapter two, Paul showed how circumcision in God's eyes was in the heart, not in the flesh. And certainly circumcision was the sign of the covenant between God and Abraham and his descendants. But the, co the covenant was given to form the basis of a relationship between um, Abraham and his descendants and God. It was not just a mark on a rather sensitive part of the body. God wanted reality in that relationship. And, <coughs> and as, as Paul moves into chapter 3, and remember there are no chapter breaks in the original letter, he asks the natural question, well, what advantage then has the Jew? Or what is the profit of circumcision? Because Paul had said back in chapter 2, verse 11, well, there is no partiality with God, and that was spoken in the context of, of discussing Jews and Gentiles. And in response, Paul gives a very firm answer, very positive answer, much in every way. God had chosen the Jews uh, to receive his word, to be his witnesses, to show the rest of the world what God is like and what he requires of mankind. And we all owe a great deal to the Jewish people for faithfully passing down the scriptures to us so that we can have them freely available. They have guarded them very, very well. And they've been very meticulous in the way that they have copied and transcribed them so that we have the scriptures today accurately. Now the primary benefit that Paul highlights here in this passage is that uh, to them, to the Jews, were committed the oracles of God. In other words, the written word of God. And I don't think it's a random coincidence that God um, gave the scriptures to the Jews, because from God's written word, they had clear instructions on how they were to live. And it was quite different from the pagan nations around them. Now, obviously, at the time when Paul wrote, the, the, the scriptures would have been essentially the Old Testament, because the New Testament was just about being starting to be written at that time. <coughs> um, but the Old Testament, nevertheless, pointed to Christ. They pointed to his coming kingdom, and they gave wisdom for living as God wanted them to live. And as an example of the benefits of living by God's law, when the bubonic plague swept across Europe uh, several hundred years ago, it killed one in three people, but the Jews were left largely untouched because of the, the dietary and hygiene laws that were in God's law. They followed the hygiene laws, the dietary laws, and they were largely untouched by the, the bubonic plague. There's wisdom in what God says in his word. And God gave the law to Israel for their good, and that good has extended beyond the Jews to the rest of humanity. And in verse 3, Paul tackles the issue of unbelief of many Jews. Well, does that undermine the faithfulness of God? Uh, but, uh, but note that only some were unfaithful, not all. And Paul's answer comes in verse 4, and it's a very robust, certainly not. Perish the thought. It's, it's the strongest negative that the Greek can produce. The very suggestion of such a thing would be unthinkable. And that alone, I think, counters what's called replacement theology that is floating around so much of the church today, that suggests that because Israel was unfaithful, God has finished with Israel and passed his covenant on to the church instead. <coughs> if anything, I think the unfaithfulness of Israel was going to prove the greater faithfulness of God as he stays true to his covenant with them. Apart from anything else, if God has finished with Israel and basically gone back on his covenant with them that was as an everlasting covenant, what security does that give us in the church? God might decide he wants to pass it on to someone else. But no, God is faithful. He will always keep his word. And God knew all along that only part of Israel would truly believe, despite the many miracles that he did on their behalf. Consider for a moment the Exodus that was such a powerful demonstration of God's working on their behalf after the 10 plagues that fell upon Egypt. Then there was the Red Sea crossing 
the giving of the law where God spoke so powerfully on Mount Sinai. Consider also God's provision of food and water during the 40 years in the wilderness. The fact that their shoes didn't wear out. I remember hearing a, a talk, I think it was David Porson some years ago, and he said that is a stunning miracle. He's been out in the wilderness and after a few hours his shoes wore out. Uh, but no, 40 years worth of the same shoes because they didn't wear out, and that's God's doing. Then there was the crossing into the Promised Land through the River Jordan when it was in flood, followed by the miraculous conquest of Jericho. We could go on, but these are not mere stories. They were actual events that Israel saw and experienced. So they were without excuse if they didn't have faith in the living God. God has been faithful to Israel, and it will not be in vain. Paul's comment is, indeed, let God be true, but every man a liar. Even if everyone denied the truth and existence of God, that wouldn't alter the fact that God exists and is true. He is there, daily keeping his word, and surely that is so reassuring for us as Christians to know that God is keeping his word even today. But it also demonstrates that everyone who disregards or rejects, God's, rejects God is a liar. And arguably that includes anyone who disregards God's promises and his faithfulness to Israel. God is there. He exists. He's real. He's faithful. He's righteous. And he expects a positive response of faith from each person. And if that isn't forthcoming, then God is fully justified in passing judgment on the unbeliever. At the end of verse 4, Paul draws from Psalm 51, verse 4, which, which describes the time when David confessed his sin with Bathsheba. And there, David acknowledged that God is just when he speaks, and that his judgment is just and blameless. Paul moves on, verses 5 to 8. <clears throat> but if our unrighteousness demonstrates the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Is God unjust who inflicts wrath? I speak as a man. Certainly not. For then how will God judge the world? For if the truth of God has increased through my lie to his glory, why am I also still judged as a sinner? And why not say, let us do evil that good may come, as we are slanderously reported, and as some affirm that we say, their condemnation is just. And here Paul puts the case of someone who might want to contradict God and argue that their sin, well, it only goes to show God's righteousness. Perhaps we could say that Judas Iscariot would, would, might be an example here because he might argue that his sinful act of betraying Jesus only served to fulfill the purposes of God in getting Jesus to the cross to die for fallen humanity. But no, Judas might also argue that if he hadn't done it, then God's plans for salvation would have been frustrated. But the truth is that God would always have achieved his purposes, and yet Judas is still accountable for his sinful actions, just as we are still accountable for our sinful actions. But hallelujah, we have the grace of God in Jesus. It was still Judas's wickedness that betrayed Jesus, even though God used it. And what, when Paul says that he speaks as a man, he doesn't mean that he's without the inspiration of the Holy Spirit here or without the apostolic authority that he has. Instead, he explains that only, that only as a man, a fallen man at that, would anyone dare to question God's justice. And God is just and he's wise. Then in verse 6, Paul again gives a robust denial of what is alleged. And he says, certainly not. Again, it's the same very strong negative in the Greek. God is right to, just fallen, to judge fallen humanity. And how can we honestly question God's righteousness? God knows all things. He knows all about us. He knows all of our motives, all of our thoughts, all of our deeds, 
There's nothing that's hidden from God. And as soon will Paul say in verse 23, that'll be next time, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And the fact of Israel's unfaithfulness, even though partial, actually vindicates God's word and his righteousness because his word also foretold it. And as such, God's truth has increased in the eyes of mankind, at least it's always been true, of course, by man's short, shortcomings because they confirm the truth of God's word. And God's truth is absolute. It can't be diminished or increased. It's always 100%. But Paul is saying that through man's sin, God is shown to be true because God has said it would happen that way. But then in verse 8, as some apparently argue that sin can be a good thing, Paul rebuts that by saying that their condemnation is just. Paul understood that God will judge the world, both Jew and Gentile. And many Jews of Paul's day believed that God would condemn the Gentile for his sin, but save the Jew despite his sin. Well, that's a bit skewed. We are all, we all fall short before God. God is true. His word is true and his righteous condemnation of every sinner is just. And no one will be shaking their fist at Jesus at the great white throne, alleging that his judgment is wrong. Each one of us is accountable to God for how we spend our time on the earth. And the longer I'm here, the more quickly it seems to go by. And God in his love has done everything needed for each person to be saved. So God's sorted the problem. The crucial question for us, each one of us, is what will we do with that gracious provision of salvation from God? And it's the most important question that any of us will face. God will not force us because that would not be true love. But equally, God cannot compromise his character and his righteousness that must punish sin. And the penalty for death, the penalty is death eternally. So Paul summarizes then what he's been saying in verse 9. He says, what then? Are we better than they? Not at all. For we have previously charged both Jews and Greeks that they are all under sin. Paul was Jewish, so he identifies with the we, namely the Jews. They are no better before God than the Gentiles, the pagans, and any other group of people. Everyone is what he calls under sin. And in our natural selves, we are under slavery to sin, which is why we all need rescuing, and why God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die for us. Now, Paul hasn't yet reached the good news part that speaks of our rescue in Jesus. That's coming next time. But he is clearly laying out the problem so that the goodness of the gospel, when it comes, shines all the more brightly. Uh, there's a commentator, a Calvary pastor, called John Corson. He makes the comment that whatever smoke screens have been put up by the heathen or the, or the Hebrew, Romans 1 to 3 blows them away. The heathen is indicted by creation, the hypocrite by conscience, and the Hebrew by the commandments. God has spoken clearly to every generation throughout history, leaving all throughout without excuse. I think that's quite a nice sort of couple of sentence summary of Romans 1 to 3 that I've spent several weeks laboring over. So if you want just a, a quick pithy summary, there you go. And then Paul moves on in verses 10 to 18 with a fairly lengthy series of references to the Old Testament. Um, <clears throat> let's just read the passage first. Verse 10, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good, no, not one. Their throat is an open tomb. With their tongues they have practiced deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. 
Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now that's sort of quite a collection of uh, quotes or uh, passages drawn from the Old Testament. We'll go through those as we, as we work through it. First reference um, is, covers verses 10 to 12 there, and that's drawn from Psalm uh, 14, verses 1 to 3. So let me read that bit. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there are any who understand, who seek God. They have all turned aside. They have together become corrupt. There is none who does good, no, not one. And the older I get in the Lord, the more I realize how profound are the effects of the fall. We, we, ju- we are so affected by it. And you look around at the world and it's, it's just spread so far. And uh, it, it's so sad because God made this earth perfect. He made, made Adam and Eve without sin. We truly are lost without the only salvation that is available to us by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Um, And as we stand before God outside of Christ, no one is righteous, as these verses say. And that's why we need the righteousness of Christ to be acceptable before God so we can come into his presence. And we should perhaps remember the context of, uh, of Psalm 14, um, where David starts off by saying, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. And uh, so if you are an atheist this morning and you say there is no God, sorry, God defines you as a fool. Um, but actually, we could go a bit further than that because um, the words there is are not in the Hebrew. So, the fool has said in his heart, no God. And it, it, it is the statement of the atheist who wants to say, no God, there is no God. But also, it, the Hebrew can, can suggest that Paul is, is saying, um, be gone, God, be gone. It's so, uh, there might be a possibility of someone who, who is telling God to get out of his life. He's also a fool. So it's into this context from the psalm that Paul is writing. The ones who don't believe there is a God or those who reject God are the ones he says are corrupt and foolish. And that fits well with the suppression of the evidence of God in creation that we saw in chapter 1 and the result of which was corruption. Anyone who is not living in a... a, living relationship with God through Jesus will not understand the profound beauty of our salvation that he's made available to us in Christ. And fallen man will not seek God because of the corruption of sin. And Paul is just drumming home the desperate state of all humanity without Jesus. And this is part of his argument that's taken up most of the first three chapters of his letter. He's not saying so much that no one can seek God, but we do need the Holy Spirit to draw us to him. But if our minds are clouded by sin and corruption, then we won't seek God. And Paul is taking time to spell out the darkness of a mind that is alienated from God. We, We truly are away from God if our minds are clouded by sin. And the outcome for humanity outside of Christ is seen in verse 12. They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good. No, not one. And the more that people suppress the truth, the more they will not understand the truth. And God is the only real source of truth. And this, I think, has a very contemporary ring about it, as so much of our society seems to be so bent on suppressing the truth these days. They call black white and white black. To turn aside from God is futile. Life becomes meaningless, and if not checked, the corruption will only get worse. And the word unprofitable has the idea of rotten fruit, 
it speaks of something that was permanently bad and therefore useless. And surely that reinforces the need to teach our children, whether it's their own children or nieces or nephews or grandchildren or, or whatever, teach our children the truth of God's Word, that it is without error and is thoroughly sufficient for life. If, if children are brought up believing they are merely a random bunch of, of rearranged chemicals and they come from monkeys, then it's no surprise if they start behaving like one. Life is then meaningless and futile. And we see it occurring so frequently in so, to so many people. But the glory of the gospel that is in Christ is that we have a God-given purpose and a meaning in life. The Bible does make sense because it is God's word. And only God who knows the heart of each person gives the correct diagnosis of the plight of humanity and then the only cure, faith in what Jesus did on the cross for us. And then as we look at verse 13, Paul look, draws on several Old Testament scriptures. In verse 13a, Paul quotes from Psalm 5 verse 9, for there is no faithfulness in their mouths, their inward part is destruction, their throat is an open tomb, they flatter with their tongue. <coughs> Excuse me. In verse 13b, he draws from Psalm 140, verse 3, they sharpen their tongues like a serpent, the poison of asps is under their lips. And then in uh, verse 14 of our passage in Romans, Paul then draws from Romans 10, Psalm 10, verse, verse 7, their mouth is full of cursing and deceit and oppression. Under his tongue is trouble and iniquity. So in verses 13 to 14 of Romans, Paul talks of human speech, mentioning the throat, uh, the tongue, the lips, and the mouth. And I don't know about you, but that reminds me of Jesus' diagnosis of speech, which we find in Matthew 12, 34. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. For the unsaved person who is spiritually dead, their speech will reflect the inner corruption that spiritual death brings. Now, obviously not everything that is said by unsaved people is corrupt, but they cannot bring any spiritually life-giving speech because that's only possible for the born-again believer. Only a true Christian will praise God in spirit and truth and will declare that Jesus is Lord. Perhaps we should ask ourselves, how much have we allowed God to transform our thought life and therefore our speech? With the Holy Spirit living within, our speech should be wholesome and edifying. If our words are mainly negative and discouraging, then I would suggest we need to get before God and ask him to renew our minds afresh. There should be none of the poison in our words that Paul speaks of, nor the cursing or the bitterness. Our throat shouldn't be an open tomb speaking words of spiritual death, but we should be speaking words of life and goodness. So when we go out to our life tomorrow, whether it's at home or at work or school or wherever, what words are we going to use? Will, there be, will it be life and goodness? And equally, we should be careful what we listen to so that we avoid harmful and corrupt speech. The body of Christ, we're part of that here this morning, should be a wholesome place where everyone is safe from corrupt influence. So let's all play our part in that and build each other up. So in this section so far, Paul has dealt with the mind in verses 10 to 12, the mouth in verses 13 and 14, and now he addresses the feet in verses 15 and 16, 7 and 17. He says, their feet are swift to shed blood, destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace they have not known. And here he's quoting from Isaiah 59, verses 7 and 8, which says, Their feet run to, do, run to evil, and they make haste to shed innocent blood. Their thoughts are thoughts of iniquity. Wasting and destruction are in their paths. The way of peace they have not known. 
and there is no justice in their ways. They have made themselves crooked paths. Whoever takes that way shall not know peace. And the corruption of fallen man is profound, and the salvation that we have in Christ is so needed by us all. In verse 15, Paul talks of feet that are swift to shed blood. And I don't know about you, but I, it just seems to me that in the news these days, there is so much more swift shedding of blood. There's so much more murder, stabbings, rape, or, or whatever it is. It's just, we have such a corrupt society. It's, but then, well, I don't know whether it's a media agenda or whether the, uh, the violence really is increasing. I think it must be. But haven't we moved away from God as a society over recent decades? We see a huge amount of violence on TV, in films, on, on computer games. So we're being anaesthetized to the horror of violence. And it's all part of the corruption of fallen society. I mean, who in their right minds wants to have life filled with the destruction and the misery that verse 16 speaks of? But the corruption of modern society in the Western world is such that these things flourish. And Paul knew well the condition of the human heart. And so he says in verse 17, the way of peace we have not known. And how we need God's mercy and grace and his peace and his forgiveness. And then Paul concludes uh, this little section in verse 18. There is no fear of God before their eyes. And here he draws from Psalm 36, verse 1, which says, An oracle within my heart concerning the transgression of the wicked, there is no fear of God before his eyes. And I think this is a fitting conclusion to this section, where Paul started by speaking of the one who rejects God being a fool, and then inevitably there will be no fear of God in the eyes, the mind, and the thinking of the one who rejects or disregards God. Proverbs chapter 9 verse 10 tells us the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. And for our life on earth, we need God's wisdom to live well in a way that pleases Him. And the majority today live without that fear of God. So their way, their way of life is based upon what seems good to them. And in the context of eternity, it is utter folly to ignore God and the salvation that he offers us through Jesus. And yet so many do just that. And I would suggest that as believers, we need a healthy fear of God. Not that we're terrified, he's our father, but a, a reverence and a respect for our living God, who has so graciously given us salvation in Christ. And then just to conclude with today, Paul wraps up his, his exposure of fallen man, and we really are <coughs> on the cusp of the good news, which will be next time. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. And the law of Moses was given to Israel, so they were to live under that law. And Paul has quoted from various parts of the Old Testament in these last few verses and has made it clear that Israel had fallen short of what God required of them. So we've got the law of Moses, you've got the quotes from the rest of the Old Testament. It sort of broadens out the scope of God's requirements. Actually, we all need to do that. We all need to live as God wants. And the result is that every mouth may be stopped. No one can bring a sufficient argument before God such that his holiness is satisfied unless we have Christ. Because the whole world has become guilty before God. And that's what Paul has been at pains to say over these last three chapters. We are all guilty. So therefore, we all need salvation. And that's his next major topic, which will come next time. In verse 20, uh, we see that the law was given to expose our innate sinfulness. Not so that we might keep it as such, or parts of it, and then feel self-righteous. We don't try and obey God so we feel good about it. 
we obey to please him because that should be the natural outflow of wanting to walk with him. And we all, uh, the, keeping the law can't save us. It will never make us sufficiently righteous in God's sight because we all have a sin nature and that alone cuts us off from God. And because we have a sin nature, we all commit sins. And the argument that Paul has built to describe our plight is very comprehensive. Everyone is involved and we have all fallen short of God's standards. So Paul has spent part of chapter one until now showing that man is sinful and without excuse. And our condition before God outside of Christ is desperate. We all deserve God's judgment. God is pure and holy. He is one who cannot look, look upon any kind of sin. And we are certainly not pure and holy. So therefore, without Jesus, there is no basis for a meaningful relationship between God and man. It's not there. And yet God created this world. He created mankind so that he could have a relationship with us. He is love and he wants to share that love with his creation in a lasting and a loving relationship. Consequently, we need a bridge to, to bridge that gap. We need a solution. And Paul will go on to describe the good news that we have in Christ and that'll come, as I say, next time. And what God has done to overcome the broken relationship between him and mankind is amazing. It ticks every box that needs to be ticked. He's done everything needed to satisfy his holy and righteous character, so that isn't compromised, but also he's poured out his love to deal with sin in Christ. And the love that he has for us is overwhelming. So we should never become blase about God's love. He's done so, so much for us. It's so rich and so beautiful. And we will be literally, eternally grateful to him for what he's given us in Jesus. But God's love is love that each one of us must respond to individually. His love demands that he will never force himself on anyone. None of us could achieve the perfection needed to satisfy God's holy nature. So God had to pour the punishment of his wrath against sin upon his own son in our place. We'll see more of that next time. But please take the time over the next week to consider the majesty and the depth of God's love. It is stunning. And we all need it very, very profoundly. And to turn away from that love is a very serious thing. But to receive it and embrace it in Christ gives life and joy for eternity. I hope you start to get a little bit excited. The good, the good is coming. And for that joy, that, that prospect, that salvation, God deserves our wholehearted praise and worship. Shall we pray? Father, thank you for this passage. Thank you that it concludes what is a very comprehensive description of our lost state without Jesus Christ. But Lord, we thank you. It just so beautifully sets the platform. It sets the dark background against which the diamond beauty of the jewel of salvation comes. And Lord, help us to, to see afresh who we are before you, but also who we are in Christ before you. You've done so much for us, Lord, and we thank you. And help us to be thrilled and excited with our salvation. Thank you, Father. Amen.